Welcome to Crossroads at Montgomery. We are so glad you could join us this morning. If this is your first time here, I'm Ben, the worship director here at Crossroads. This morning we're going to be joining together and worshiping our King. And regardless of where we are, whether we're sitting in our living room or you're with other people, we can still lift His name and know that He is with us. The Spirit is here and we can welcome Him into our homes, into our lives, and wherever we are. So why don't you join me? The atmosphere is changing now For oh, the Spirit of the Lord is here The evidence is all around That the Spirit of the Lord is here with your love, your love surrounds us. You're the reason we came to encounter your love, your love surrounds us. Atmosphere is changing now. For the Spirit of the Lord is here. The evidence is all around that the Spirit of the Lord is here. Overflow. Fill our hearts with your love, your love surrounds us. You're the reason we came to encounter your love, your love surrounds us. Yeah. Of God, fall fresh on us. We need your presence. Your kingdom come, your will be done here as in heaven. Spirit.
miracle can happen now For the Spirit of the Lord is here The evidence is all around That the Spirit of the Lord is here I was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight It was my truth Till I met you I was breathing but not alive All my failures I tried to hide It was my truth Till I met you called my name and I ran out of that grave out of the darkness into your glorious day you called my name and I ran out of that grave out of the Now your mercy has saved my soul Now your freedom is all that I know The old man knew when I met you You called my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious day You called my name And I ran out of that grave Well, hey, Crossroads, this is Pastor Mike. It is great to be back together again. Thanks for tuning in. Well, today we're con continuing our series called The Perfect Leader. We looked at what God expects from civil leaders. We've looked at the problem of evil. And last Sunday, we looked at Jesus as the perfect leader. Now, this is a great week, isn't it, to be talking about leadership? In fact, that's why we decided to do this series right now. Although, when we made that decision, we had no idea what kind of a leadership transition we'd be looking at in our country. But we knew that there would be a transition of leadership, changing from one leader to another. And uh, we have been watching that. So let me ask you a question, kind of, kind of based on last week's message. Who is a leader? Is it someone who's famous? Uh, certainly, at least they're influential. Maybe they are even larger than life. But you see, what we saw last week is that uh, that's not God's definition of leadership. In fact, the, the definition we gave last week goes like this. Leadership is the process of influence. You see, any time you seek to influence the thinking or the behavior, or the development of people in their personal or their professional lives, then you are taking on the role of a leader. That means that you are probably a leader to someone. 
The question is, what kind of a leader will you and I be? The other question we looked at last week was whether or not Jesus is worth emulating as a leader. Uh, you know, it's, it's easy to think that we as Christians, you know, our answer to everything is Jesus, and Jesus is the perfect everything, including the perfect leader. But we tried to point out last week that this idea of Jesus' model of leadership being worth emulating, that it's more significant than that. People in the world of leadership education uh, often refer to Jesus' servant leader model. And it's followed by people that, that you'd be surprised. People that don't espouse our faith, but see something worth emulating in the life and the leadership model of Jesus. The life-changing power of Jesus' leadership model explains how, we said this last week, a first century Jewish cult that was led by a crucified leader, one that had no territory, no military, no political authority, not only did it thrive, survive, but it thrived through the first and second and third centuries. And eventually, the empire, Rome, that was trying to eradicate that cult ended up by embracing it. Even today, almost every aspect of our lives around the world is impacted by the life of Jesus. It's even on our calendars. Things are dated B.C., A.D. The reference point is Jesus' birth for the world. Now, last week we also asked, you know, what kind of outcomes should we expect if we follow Jesus' leadership model? We acknowledge that Jesus' model of leadership was very different from what we see around us. Yeah. It was based on not being served, but serving. And we should be reminded as followers of Jesus that Jesus intends to replace much of what, we current, what, what is currently in place. And some of those things we might find ourselves fighting to hang on to. Which means that if we're going to follow Jesus as our leader, we should expect to experience some loss. In fact, I feel like we have to pause there for a second before we go racing on. What are you and I willing to lose in order to emulate the kind of leadership that Jesus lived out? It's one thing to say, oh yeah, you know, I follow Jesus, but what if it costs us something to actually follow Jesus? Are we ready? Are we ready to experience the loss of some things that we used to hold on dearly to? Well, learning to lead like Jesus will feel unnatural. It'll feel counterintuitive, and it will require some intentional effort on our part. So we're going to dive into that in just a moment, but uh, I think we need to pray first and ask for God's help. So let's pray together, shall we? <sighs> Heavenly Father, we pause, and as your people, your family, your children, we lift our voices together to you. Each of us have needs and, and concerns each of us are carrying burdens even now as we watch. So we offer those things to you. We acknowledge them before you. We remind ourselves that you, your promises are that you have plans for us, not to harm us, but plans for things that are good for a future. That you are actively involved in helping us to follow you more closely and to live lives that will experience the joy that you intended. You want to help us make decisions that are better so that we avoid the pain of the mistakes that we've made in the past. Lord, I know that there are people watching this morning who are hurting right now because of physical maladies, illness, sickness, I know that there are others who are hurting because of loss. I think of my brother Brian and the loss of his 25-year-old uh, daughter, Brianna, just this week. And uh, I just ask that you would comfort them 
he and Gina and, and their family. There are others who've experienced loss in the last few weeks, and, and all of them are feeling that, that sense of, of grief, emptiness, minister to them. We also know that the events that have been occurring in our nation, common, whether it's the, the, the virus or vaccines or, 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 or our government's transitions, we have all continued to experience sort of a, an upheaval, a turmoil, we're, it's like there's always another shoe to drop, and it's easy for us to feel unsettled. Would you settle our hearts this morning? Would you remind us that not only are you sovereign, you're in control, you know exactly what is happening and what will happen, but you can use it for your purposes. You are, you are making sure that your purposes will come to pass. So we can rest in that. So for those who are hurting because of broken relationships, those who are hurting from losses, those that are uh, weary from all of the turmoil, we ask your hand of blessing and peace. We, of course, ask for the leaders of our nation. We ask on their behalf, would you bless them with wisdom? Would you help them to decide to pursue what is good so that you can bless their efforts? We pray for those in our government who are believers in you, that you will give them to the courage to stand for what you value most. May they be voices of reason and compassion. And we pray that our nation would move forward because we believe that uh, lives that are lived in peace are the best opportunity we have to share the gospel with others. And so we lift our nation and its leaders to you. Bless them in every way that you can. Steer them from wrong toward what is right. Now, open our hearts and lives. Help us to be ready to not just hear what it means to be like you, to lead like you, but to be ready to embrace that, even if it means we have to let go of something else. So guide us and transform us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, today, we're going to start a part of our series on leadership, The Perfect Leader. The next couple of Sundays, we're going to actually follow an outline that's found in a book that was published, published back in 2005 by Ken Blanchard and Phil Hodges. And the book is called Lead Like Jesus. And in that, uh, in that book, there's an outline. They, they talk about the head of a leader, the hands of a leader, the habits of a leader, and today we're going to start that process by talking about the heart of a leader. If we are going to learn what it means to lead like Jesus, it means we're going to have to change. And change comes from our hearts. If you have a Bible, you want to open it to Proverbs chapter 4. Or you can follow along in the sermon notes. Just click on the, on the notes tab and uh, it'll come right up. All the passages are there. In Proverbs chapter 4... Uh, verse 1, we read, Listen, my sons, to a father's instruction. Pay attention and gain understanding. And then skipping down to verse 23, we read this. Above all else, guard your heart. For everything you do flows from it. Our heart is the seat of our emotions. No, it's the seat of our motivations. Our heart is where the why behind the things we do. That's where the why resides. Now, you know, the messaging around us in our culture, it, it offers this advice that says we should all follow our heart. <laughs> Essentially, it's a belief that our heart is like a compass inside of us, and it'll direct you to your own truth, your own true north. You just have to have the courage to follow it. It says that, your heart is a true guide that will lead you to true happiness. It's a belief system that says that if you're lost, your heart will save you. It can sound so simple and so beautiful and so liberating. And for lost people, it's a tempting gospel to believe. Until, of course, you consider that your heart is sometimes kind of sociopathic at times, right? I mean, think about it for a minute. 
What does your heart tell you? Are you really sure you want to do what your heart tells you? Let me just be honest. There are a lot of things that my heart tells me that I don't even want to speak out loud. Okay? Let's just talk about driving. No, no, let's not talk about any of that. Okay? <laughs> are we really sure we're supposed to follow our heart? Look, the truth is our hearts were never designed to lead us. Our hearts were designed to follow. One of the effects of sin was that it put a, the natural inclination of our heart is to, is to follow whatever benefits us the most. Jeremiah 17.9 says that the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond a cure. Jesus said something similar in Matthew 15, verse 19, when he said, For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. Look, we all come into this world pretty self-centered. And if you don't believe it, just offer to babysit some, somebody's baby sometime. Okay? They're like, like little self-machines. We all come that way. The only other option for us is to intentionally follow Jesus as our example. He's the one who said he's here not to be served but to serve. That's what Paul was talking about in Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, when he says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking at your own interests only, but also to the interests of others. See, our heart is the source of the why, why we live the way we do. And our hearts often are suspended between these two polarities, these, these two tensions of self and others. The heart contrast is between the self-serving leader and the servant leader. In his book about leadership, uh, the book, his latest book is called The Motive. Patrick Lencioni describes two hearts this way. He says there is the rewards-centered leadership, and then there is the responsibility-centered leadership. Those who lead for rewards, he says, often see leadership as a prize for years of hard work. And are, they're, they're drawn to leadership for its trappings, attention, status, power, money. Often reward-centered leaders see the world as a kind of give a little, take a lot proposition. Give what you have to, take everything you can. They tend to put their own agenda, their own safety, their own status, their own gratification ahead of those that they lead. Now those who lead from responsibility Lencioni writes, understand that it is the only valid motivation for leadership and that sacrifice and suffering are inevitable in the pursuit of serving others. Now, Ken Blanchard in his book, Leading Like Jesus, uh, he, he uses a different motif, but it, it lines up perfectly with the self-serving leader and the servant leader. And, and he talks about the heart as ego. At the center of every heart is an ego. But there's two ways of looking at ego, or two kinds of ego. The first, ego, means edging God out. E-G-O, edging God out. They tend to think that they own things. They think that their positions are theirs. They think that their possessions are theirs. They think that even their people are theirs, my friends. And they tend to then protect whatever is theirs. The other kind of ego stands for exalting God only. You see, people who are seeking to exalt God only, they know everything is God's. The saying, you know, when the game is over, it all goes back in the box. It all belongs to God. People who are exalting God only, they know that their positions, whatever, however high they go, are just platforms from which to do God's will. They understand that uh, 
they are just temporary stewards of the possessions God has given them. It'll all go back in the box. They love the very best they can because they realize there's no guarantee of tomorrow. The people that I love, I don't possess. I don't know how long I'll have them. And so they love on the spot. And people who are exalting God only, they are free from the anxiety that comes from trying to protect their stuff. <laughs> Again, they know it's, they're just really being stewards. It's God's stuff. You know, humility, often we talk about the humility involved with being a leader like Jesus. And I just want to make sure that, that we've got this straight. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. Instead, humility is simply thinking of yourself less. <laughs> now, the question today isn't which kind of leader are you? Like somehow some of you are at one and some of us are the other. The question is, where are you on this continuum? The tension between the self-serving leader style and the servant leader style. And what's so interesting is that people who really have a very, very limited scope of leadership can still be very, very selfish and self-centered. They still think, oh, if only I was more famous or more popular or more influential, then I would have more friends, I would have more money. You hear how it's about them? So the question for us today is, on this tension, which direction are we moving? Are we moving toward one or toward the other? Do you continue to edge God out? That's the mark of a self-serving leader. Or are we intentionally seeking to exalt God only, becoming a servant leader? Now, how do we know? I've got a couple things that I think we should ask ourselves as we think about what's going on in our hearts because that's where the rest of our leadership model will come from. So the first question is, is this, what is my ideal? Am I putting something in God's place or do I worship and reverence God alone? I'll be the first one to admit that sometimes there are needs deep inside of my heart and, and before I'm even aware of it, I'm kind of working a situation to somehow satisfy a need that I feel as though this circum circumstance is about me. And it takes great intentionality to stop, to silence that voice, and to be reminded, this is God's story, his lesson. His interest here is whether he gets glory. How can I bring him glory? So what is my ideal? Am I putting something in God's place? I'm just going to pause. Putting something in God's place. What comes to your mind? Maybe it is your career. Maybe it is your children. Maybe it is your talent or your finances or even your health. What is it that's at the center, at the throne? Who are you working for? Are you putting something else in God's place or do you worship and reverence God alone? Second question is this, what is the source of my significance? Does my success or, or the positions that I hold, does that make me feel more worthy? And again, those of you that are watching, many, if you know me, I, I like to be liked. And when I'm liked by many people, I, I can't help it. I feel better about myself. And yet, wait. I have to ask myself, is that where my self-worth comes from? And so I have to admit, this whole pandemic is my fault. It's my fault. God did all of this 
to force me to have to sit in a room alone and preach to a camera so that I could search my heart and make sure that I find my self-worth in Him alone. You see, I, we are to find our self-worth in God's unconditional love. He loves me just the way I am. And uh, that's the source of our significance. The third question is this. Who is my audience? Who am I playing for? You see, the self-serving leader often tends to value the opinions of others over God. Or do I honor God as my only audience? As though I'm saying, He is enough for me. So, what does following Jesus mean to you? You see, sometimes we'll talk about believing in Jesus, putting our faith in Him as our Savior. But, and by the way, if you're watching today and you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, I simply would ask, what's stopping you? You see, the story of Scripture, the central scarlet thread of that meta-narrative called the Bible, is that we sin. We break God's law. And that the penalty for sin is death. There's nothing we could do to erase our sin. But Jesus loved us so much that he came to earth, that he lived among us. He died on the cross and made the death payment for us. And now, having risen from the dead, he offers eternal life to everyone, anyone who will trust in him instead of themselves, who would put their faith in Him. What's stopping you from doing that today? Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. Thank you for dying for me. I don't know why you would do that, but if you died to pay for the penalty of my sin, thank you. And I would be foolish not to trust in you. Thank you for dying for me. But let me ask you, are you going to leave it right there? Some Christians talk as though that's it. That's the end of the story. But Jesus didn't end there. He invited those who had believed in him to then follow him, to become a part of the mission of sharing that message with others and living in such a way as to treat others the way God sees them. And so he invites us to not just trust in him, but to follow him. Following Jesus means leading like Jesus. Because every one of you is a leader. No one is exempt. I can't tell you how many times I've watched it happen as I trained young men and women for ministry. When they're, they come in and they're brand new and they're so excited and they're so uh, innocent and naive and happy to do whatever. And over the course of a few years of Bible college, as they learn and as they mature, as they rise to positions of authority, I watched some of them change. See, now they had earned their spot, their position, and they wielded that kind of influence amongst their peers. And often they, they used their power and authority just the way every other leader around us tends to. And then, of course, there were other student leaders who, no matter how much success they had, no matter how much they learned, it was almost still like it was their first day on campus, humble, happy to help, much quicker to listen to what you have to say than to tell them what they tell tell you what they know. And as I watch this happen over and over and over again, I would recognize it in my own life as well. We all tend to follow these models around us unless we in, instead decide to learn to lead like Jesus. So you are a leader somewhere. 
I'm just wondering what kind of a leader are you going to be? I wonder if someone will notice a difference in you this week because of what we've talked about today. I hope so. In fact, I pray so, which is why I'm going to pray for you right now. Father God, I pray for each person listening right now. And I'm, I'm including myself because I was the first person to hear this, this message. We want to honor you. We want to be leaders who lead like you. Having experienced your leadership, having, having seen what, how intent you are at, at putting others first, we want to be like you. And so I pray for each person watching today that they would become convinced that their faith would be galvanized in this one thing, that they are able to be intentional about being more like you as a leader. Regardless of how much of a leader they think they are, God, would you give them the courage to make changes in their lives this week? And, and would you be so gracious as to let someone notice the difference in them? After all, that's what we want. We want to live lives that draw attention to you. So would you bless us as we try to apply this message to our lives this week? And I ask it in your precious name. Amen. Amen. See you again soon. God bless. Bye-bye. Like that, that one, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what's going on in here? Oh, we're just teaching Jaden the official worship signals. Well, what's that? I'm, I'm not following. You know, the things people do when they're singing worship music in church. For example, this, the hold my TV. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I did that one. Yeah. Uh, I, I did this on Sunday. This is the touchdown. I. <laughs> oh, uh, what about this one? Oh, I know this one. It's uh, the hold my burrito. Oh, I've only ever heard it called the hold my baby. <laughs> Yeah, you're right. That's a rather large burrito. <laughs> we are Connect HQ. Every day we help the people of the world live God's way. We look for the links, make the connection, and you never know what might happen. My name's Jaden, and this is the time we learned why and how we worship. Oh, hi. Welcome to Connect HQ. I'm Mike. Hi, Mike. My name's Bree. I heard this was the place to come if I have questions about God. You heard right. My name's Jaden. It's nice to meet you. <laughs> so, how can we help you? Well, I'm interested in learning more about worship, why we worship God, and different ways we can worship God. Oh, well, I'm going to worship night at my church tonight. You're welcome to come with me. Actually, I was hoping I could study worshipers in their natural habitat, if that's possible. Oh, uh, what? I'm a researcher. I like to learn from people by watching what they do naturally. Do you think you could help me do that? Well, um, Mike, if you want to show Bree around HQ, I can start working on tracking down some links. Sure thing. Bree, I will be your tour guide. Wonderful. I have an outfit brought up for you. Do what now? Uh, Bree, 
Khaki's not really my color, by the way. Nobody wears khaki because they like the color, Mike. Now, who's that? It's Rodney. He looks like a good first subject. Okay, so what do we do now? We wait for the worshiping to start. <sighs> oh my goodness, I didn't realize how late it was. Only a couple hours until I have to leave for church. God, please help me find the right links for Bree. I don't want to miss out on worshiping you tonight. Thanks. Amen. Okay. Reverse. Let's see what I can find. Bree! How long are we gonna sit here? How long does it take a person to start worshiping? It's not something you can plan on. Hey, I have an idea. Here, you stay here. I'm gonna go talk to him like I normally would. I promise, it will not interfere with your study. Thinking on your feet. I like it. Do it. Mm. Ah! Ah! Where did you come from, Mike? <laughs> and what are you wearing? Uh, I am trying out a new uniform. Okay. I don't think khaki's your color. I know, right? Oh, so what are you doing? I'm just looking over footage from the outside that I took earlier this week. Look at that mountain, it's beautiful. Good job, Rodney. <laughs> well, it's not me, it's God. God made that mountain. And God made every tree and every bird. <laughs> God made everything that we see and everything that we don't see, no matter how big or small. That's, that's amazing. <laughs> For sure, God is awesome. God is awesome. And I need to do something to show him how awesome I think he is. God deserves my worship. God deserves my worship. That's a great point, Rodney. I know what I have to do. Hmm? Impromptu worship dance party time! Impromptu worship dance party time! <laughs> talking about how amazing it was that God created the mountains and the trees and the birds. That's one reason why we worship God, because he created everything in the universe. He created you, he created me, he created our friends and family, and because of that, he is worthy of our worship. Ooh, which, which ties in perfectly with the verse link I just found. Do you want me to teach it to you? Of course. Okay, so it's from the book of Revelation, chapter four, verse 11. Revelation 4, 11. Revelation 4, 11. You are worthy, our Lord and God. You are worthy, our Lord and God. To receive glory and honor and power. To receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things. For you created all things. When we realize how much God deserves our worship, we can't help but worship him. That's why Rodney started playing worship music and dancing. Those are two ways to worship God. And that's why I'm so excited to go to worship night at my church. <sighs> Fascinating. This is fascinating. Thank you both for your help. Oh, um, I'm gonna go get started on those Bible links. I don't wanna miss out on worshiping tonight. Great, so you ready to get back out there, Bree? Let's see what new subjects we can find. Hey, Bree, do you wanna, I don't know, go to a different room? I was thinking we could like climb into the vents and Watch the quiet time group pray. I don't mind staying here. I once hid in the tree in the African savanna for three days trying to catch a glimpse of a wild king cheetah. You and I have lived very different lives. I think somebody's coming. I am checking the squeakiness of chairs. <laughs> yep, still squeaky. So, what are you working on? Well, I'm working on some new ideas for a skit vision video. Ooh, what about? 
Rodney suggested that we make a video about worshiping God and all the different ways that you can do that. I just love it. So I volunteered to make a list of all the different ways. Ooh, so what do you have on the list so far? A lot of things, singing and dancing, of course, but also things like raising your hands up to God while you worship, listening to him quietly, serving others, giving to those in need, and writing about him like I am right now. It is so awesome that God gave us so many ways to worship Him. I know, and I love that I can help other people figure out ways to worship God too. Wow. Well, good luck on that video. I've got more chairs to test for squeakiness. Ooh, bye. No idea there were so many different ways to worship God. It's amazing. I know, it's not just music and dancing, it's so much more than that. Well, that leads me to another question. Out of all the ways to worship God that your friend listed, does everyone worship in all of those ways? Definitely not. God made each of us, and that includes making each of us to worship Him in a different way. So, how do I figure out how I'm supposed to worship God? Well, ask God. If you ask him for help, he'll show you the right ways to live your whole life in worship to him. I wonder what way God made me to worship him. I can't wait to find out. <sighs> Looks like Jaden found a Bible link. <gasps> Onward! Oh. I was having the hardest time finding a Bible link for you, Bree, but I took a moment and I asked God to help me and he guided me to the perfect video. I can't wait to see it. This is the story about the God who loves us in the Bible. We find truth and purpose to love God and love others. We're searching God's word for things to discover. This book is alive for the answers and It's alive, see the wonderful stories inside Every day I'm searching, read through history and poetry How much Jesus loves me, God's great story lives There's no other book like this, this book is alive It was Passover time, Jerusalem was filled with people When Jesus reached the Mount of Olives a hill overlooking Jerusalem, he told two of his disciples to find a donkey. They found the donkey and put their cloaks on it. Jesus rode on the donkey, fulfilling the Bible verse that says, Here comes your king, Jerusalem, riding on a donkey. Jesus rode the donkey down to Jerusalem. Many people remembered his miracles and joined him. They put cloaks and palm branches on the road before him to honor him. They hoped that Jesus was God's promised Savior. So they shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Blessed is the King of Israel! The whole world is following him, the Pharisees grumbled. Tell them to be quiet, Jesus. Even if everyone stopped shouting, Jesus replied, the stones would still praise me. Jesus is our God and King. The people of Jerusalem worshipped him because they knew he deserved all the glory and honor they could give him. And if the people didn't worship Jesus, the rocks would. Because everything God's created knows how awesome and worthy he is, rocks included. How would a rock worship? You know, I don't know. I always assumed it was something like, <gasps> like that. Interesting. <laughs> Interesting. I can't thank you both enough for helping me answer my question. I feel like now I have a better understanding of why and how we worship God. I'm not going to forget that God deserves my worship. You know, it was awesome watching other people worship in their natural habitat. And I'll admit, the clothes kind of grow on me after a while. Oh my goodness, I need to go. I don't want to be late for worship night. Oh, have a good time, Jaden. I learned a lot from watching you worship too. Me? Well, just a few minutes ago when you said, you were having a hard time finding the right Bible link, but then you took a moment and asked God for help and he led you to the perfect video. You both served me and brought glory to him and according to my notes, those are both two great ways to worship God. Huh, 
I guess I was worshiping God without even realizing it. You know what, that is so awesome that we can worship God anywhere, not just in a church. Thanks for pointing that out, Bree. Happy to be of service. Hi, I'm Mike and I'm a part of Connect HQ. I have this great verse I wanna share with you. Say it with me like this. Revelation 4:11. You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things. God created everything that is good in this world, and that is amazing. And because of that, He is worthy. He deserves all the glory and honor that we can give Him with our whole lives. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the people there couldn't help but worship Him. They understood the truth that Jesus is our God and King. And it's not just people. All of creation knows how worthy Jesus is, even the rocks. It's easy sometimes to think that worship is only about singing worship songs and dancing, but there's so much more to it than that. We can worship God by serving others, writing about God, giving to those in need, and in so many other ways. And if you're not sure what the right way to worship God is for you, just ask Him. God made us all to worship in different ways, and He will lead you to the right answer. Don't forget, God deserves my worship. And remember, Connect HQ is here to help you. Bree, are you taking notes on me? I couldn't pass up the chance to witness the making of a real Connect transmission. You don't mind, do you? Nah. It's not the first time I was studied by the scientific community. Anybody know an awesome way to connect to God? Shout it out, let me hear it. Ooh, those are some good guesses. I like that one, but let me tell you about the one I was thinking of. How about we sing a song to God? Like when we give him our full attention and tell him how great he is. When we worship, it connects us with God because we thank him for everything he's done for us. So let's get on our feet and connect to God together.
the worship night was amazing. Although there was a really tall person standing in front of me the whole time, I could only see the left half or the right half of the stage at one time. But it was all right. I can worship God with my eyes closed. Do you want to be friends with the good and perfect God who created everything and deserves all of our worship? If so, you can make that choice today by following Jesus. All you have to remember are the ABCs. A. Admit. Admit that you've done wrong and ask God to forgive you for disobeying Him. B. Believe. Believe God sent Jesus to take the punishment for your sin. Trust that you're forgiven because Jesus made you right with God. C. Choose. Choose to spend your whole life depending on God's power to help you say no to sin. As you live and love like Jesus, tell others God is your leader and number one friend. Did you make that choice today? If so, be sure to talk about it with the parent or leader you trust.